right, everybody. I love that wonderful fellowship going on, but it is time for us to begin tonight. So if we can all come on in, grab a, grab a seat. We want to welcome all those that are watching online to our midweek service as well. Let's go ahead and uh, cover some uh, uh, congregational announcements. A few prayer requests have come in. We'll have a, a devotional thought. Brother Steve, who's our song leader here tonight? Bill Arnold. Bill Arnold has, what, five songs you'd like us to sing this evening? <laughs> oh, you were waving. Oh, okay. I he had the five out there. I was like, man, this is ambitious. Not even Fifth Wednesday or anything. So, <laughs> Galen has a lot to, he had six pages this week, right? Only three. All right. Hey, we'll get out of here early, it sounds like. All right, here we go. Helen Bitten um, is in Hutchinson Regional Medical Center. Wait a second, she came out, didn't she? She got, a, I think I got a late text this afternoon. That is exactly right. That's good news. So, yes, so she is out of uh, the hospital. Deb Wilkins, though, is in uh, room 5318, and we want to be praying for uh, Deb. Uh, Tony, I think you told me she's going to perhaps get out tomorrow. Is that right? Okay. Uh, George Batchelor, Brother George, had a fall on Saturday night, so we sure hate to hear that, but no broken bones or anything like that, just a few bumps and bruises from it, but he's home recuperating. Um, Josh Burton, Diane Dixon, Clay, uh, Clay Gillum are all home from the hospital, but still could use our uh, continued prayers. Galen was telling me his brother Alton that we've been praying for with his Cancer, um, his numbers are up. He's having to uh, do some more scans, and so things aren't looking uh, real positive right now. So we definitely want to be praying for uh, Alton. Come and go diaper and dessert, baby shower for Lily Porter, and uh, baby boy to come is this Sunday in the Fellowship Hall uh, from 1 to 2. Uh, diaper size is needed, newborn through size 4. Boy, that kind of is a large range there for a kid, you know. Uh, to donate toward a gift, uh, see uh, either Crystal, Hillary, or Michelle. Uh, Brother Don Loftus, right here. Uh, we were hanging out together today. I uh, dropped him off uh, to get some uh, tests run. And he got some news that uh, he wants to be following up on uh, after some x-rays. They found a uh, uh, kind of a spot on one of his lungs that they're going to do a biopsy next Tuesday on. So I want to be praying for Brother brother Dom, that that's nothing serious and that it could be treated whatever he's facing there. So he'd appreciate our prayers. All right, we've advertised this a lot. And I, like many of you, you know, you're like, man, I know I need to sign that book for Sandy Harris. I did it last week. I just took it to my office and signed it. What I'd like to do is just pass it around here tonight because we'd like to get this to her. So just sign your name by, say, your favorite, so uh, favorite song in the songbook or jot her a little note of well wishes going forward. So, uh, Galen, I'll just hand this over to you, and we'll just pass that around here tonight. That goes to Sister Sandy uh, Harris, and we'll try to get to that to her real soon. Carpenter Place is going to pick up uh, groceries for girls uh, early tomorrow morning. Put your non-perishable food items in the blue tub in the south foyer. Any monetary contributions to purchase meat, dairy, produce, produce can be given to the office. A list of their most needed items is on the table. Um, cost for camp is $215 a child. If you'd like to help send a child to camp through a scholarship, give full or partial scholarships, donations to the offices. And then lastly, this little announcement said, Boys of Summer, where are you? Summer is almost here, and that means baseball or perhaps more appropriately, um, men's slow pitch softball. So apparently Bueller Rec is hosting a church's men's softball league on Friday nights. It'll run about eight weeks. Um, uh, registration deadline is May 19th. Cost will be about $35 a player. Um, uh, we're looking to have 11 men to field the team. Contact Mike Plank or myself or the office for more information. Um, they said they are uh, accepting players that need to be 16 years or older by May 1st and younger than Methuselah. So uh, that's a pretty good range there. So if you're asked to play in softball, we have an opportunity. It doesn't like you have to be a star player or anything like that. This is just fun, recreational softball, and perhaps you have a friend or two that would like to play. See Mike. Mike Plank was the guy that was uh, leading us in so uh, song leading here this uh, past Sunday morning. 
Let's go ahead and bow for a word of prayer, then I'll have a Devo thought, and then we'll have, hand things over to Bill. Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for the beautiful, beautiful weather that you have blessed us with uh, here recently as things have been uh, warming up here early in the spring. Thank you for the, the wonderful uh, worship services we were able to share in this past uh, Lord's Day. Uh, Father, great turnout, great spirit of devotion and praise and, and fellowship uh, were shared by all. So we thank you so much for that and, and the opportunity we get to see each other in the middle of the week just to boost our spirits, uh, Father, to stay committed to the task of uh, living the Christian life uh, that you have called for each and every one of us to live. Uh, Father, one of our uh, great opportunities, um, obligations for one another is to pray on the behalf of each other. So we want to lift up several to you. Our sister Helen, as she has come home from the hospital, we appreciate that very much. For our sister Deb that still remains in the hospital, uh, help her to have a, a night of ease. I pray for her treatment uh, going forward. For our brother uh, George Batchelor that had a fall, pray that he would recover uh, soundly from that. So thankful that Josh is back home and Diane's uh, surgery has gone well for her uh, and our brother Clay is back home as well. So thank you for answering many prayers on their behalf. We do want to continue to lift up Alton before you here tonight. Know that he's facing very, very uh, serious um, uh, cancer uh, disease battle right now. Father, be with his faith. Uh, be with the doctors and the treatments that they're prescribing. We just pray. Uh, Father, for good things to turn around in his, his life, especially physically here, Father. Father, do you want to pray for our brother Don and the treatment that uh, he's going to experience next Tuesday? We pray it's nothing serious. And, Father, that you would provide for all of his needs. Uh, Father, we do thank you for this opportunity, again, to study, to worship. May your hand be upon Galen and uh, Perry and all those that are teaching and sharing your word here this evening. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. All righty. Literally, I just heard this. I told Ken, um, I heard Michelle say this. I wrote it down, 635 here tonight. It fits totally with my little Devo thought that I wanted to share with you before we kind of got started here tonight. She said, man, that wind is so strong, it will blow the hair right off the top of your head. And so I'm going to give you a little trivia here tonight. If you're between 20 and 30 years old, you have 615 hair follicles per square centimeter on top of your head, 20 to 30 year olds. Now, if you're a 50 year old, that's about 485 follic follicles per square centimeters. If you're in that 80 to 90 category, that's about 435. In other words, it's a diminishing return. You lose about 5% every year that you're alive and the average is about 50 to 100 hairs per day that we lose. And I know what you're thinking already. So people like me and Steve and Galen and Max, you know, maybe we kind of sped up the process here a little bit, okay? But notice what Jesus says over here in Matthew chapter 10, um, verse 29 through 31. He said, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your Father. And even the very... Hairs on your head are numbered, so don't be afraid. You're worth more than many sparrows. Twice he says it in, in a span of uh, just three or four verses. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. In this context, he's talking about physical persecution. Do not be afraid. God will take care of you. If he's taking care of sparrows, if he knows how many hair follicles that you have on your head, um, he's going to take care of you. We have a tendency to worry. It seems seem like that's kind of a natural thing for us to fall to default to. It could be physical threat, or as you turn just a few pages earlier in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he had to tell them three times in that context, do not worry, do not worry, do not worry about food and clothing and the basic necessities of life. And what did he tell them? Here's what you need to do. Instead of worrying, he said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Or as a good country Christian friend of mine uh, used to like to say, he'd say, Brother Wayne, you put God's business first and he'll take care of your business. I said, Brother, that is right, uh, right on. You put God first, he'll take care of the rest of this stuff. Now, concern is a reality. I was reading about a, uh, 
a guy who wanted to go visit a Greek monastery who was up in the mountains over there in Greece, and the only way that they could get to the monastery was to hop in a basket with a rope that was attached to the basket. And he noticed that the rope was a little bit frayed. And he said, uh, well, how often do you change this rope on here? And they said, well, every time it breaks. Now, I would be really <laughs> concerned getting in that basket, OK? That might cause me to worry a little bit. But each day has enough trouble of its own. So let's not take out a loan on the concerns or the worries about tomorrow. Let's focus on today. Let's trust in God today. Let's not be afraid. Let's not worry. Brother Bill. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah, from the heavens praise his name, praise Jehovah in the highest, all his angels praise proclaim, all his hosts together praise him, sun and moon and stars on high, praise him, O ye of heavens and ye floods above the sky. Let them praise to Jehovah for his name alone is high and his glory is exalted and his glory is exalted glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. All ye fruitful trees and cedars, all ye hills and mountains high, creeping things and beasts and cattle, birds that in Children small, let the 
and praises give Jehovah for his name alone is high and his glory is exalted and his glory is exalted and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. <laughs> <laughs> well, you you can if one of you that is uh, if one of you defectors would uh, shut the door because once you leave, you can't come back. That's right. Tony, can you get those doors just in case? Well, uh, welcome back to ECC 101. That's uh, Ecclesiastics Basic. And since this is a this is a college level course, even if it's the basics, we're going to start with a pop quiz this, tonight and, and remind us what we did last week. And the answer is one word, one word that we learned last week, and it can be in different translations, so it can be more than one word. And that word that we learned from the teacher was life is meaningless, meaningless vanity, meaningless vanity. If, but the bottom line is what? If what? Without God, without God, life is meaningless. Everything under the sun. And we'll talk about that tonight. Now, I may only have three pages of notes, but I hope to get through a, a chapter and a half. So we're going to be challenged anyway, but I hope to let. Um, <clears throat> I've been thinking today, and it goes along with life, be, God being in your life. You know, we all face something unknown at some point in our lives. If we allow God in our life, it's going to give us peace that's beyond our understanding. And so I've had a lot of that in my mind today. Um, uh, and, and so I, I, I got to tell you, somehow, I, gotta, uh, I probably shouldn't share this because it's a little embarrassing. But I'm going to share with you how God works in your wife's life sometime. Yesterday I got into my pickup, stuck my key in, and turned it over. Nothing. Nothing. I looked, checked the battery, everything looked good. I tried jumping it, nothing. Then I discovered I couldn't get my key out. Well, well, I've had a little trouble with my key before. But usually I, if I can get the steering wheel in the right place, but the steering wheel is just all over. So if, if you know me, and I know some of you know, the longer I get with that, the less desirable it is to be around me. <laughs> and so I decided I'm just going to jump in the car. Instead of even calling the mechanic, I'm going to go in there and get him to see if he can come out and, and help me. As soon as I got there, he said, well, it's probably this. And I thought, how could that happen? And we went out there. He opened the door. I knew immediately he was right. And in five seconds, he had my pickup started. How many of you know what it was? Any idea? S Steve? It was out of gear. <laughs> so I paid him his 20 bucks and took him back in. So I, if, if I'd have just spent another frustrating moment, I might have figured that out. But here's the good news. I went out to work, I did an extra yard, and I saw somebody that owed me money from last week, year that I never thought I would get, and he paid me, so I was ahead for the day. So God moves in mysterious ways, right? Okay, that's enough. I'm going to make a statement, and then we'll get into our thoughts. True happiness cannot be gained through human plans and efforts, that's what we're talking about, but comes by acknowledging a powerful and loving God who gives us all, gives us good gifts. 
Now, I don't know if you know, Wayne, but you hit on something we're going to talk about, hopefully, if I'll quit sidetracking. How many of you love science? How many of you are science people? Not a lot. You remember in school uh, they taught you that at one time in our life, people thought that everything revolved around the earth. But then came along a man in 1543 named Copernicus. How do you, do you know? Oh, is it Copernicus? Uh, Nicholas. Nic uh, well, anyway, uh, I thought it had a, a U in it. Or maybe I'd. Anyway, it may be Copernicus. Uh, it was, I'm sure. He's a Polish Australian, uh, art astronomer. He wasn't the first, but he was the first that it was accepted that made the statement say that, uh, see, you're not the only one that makes mistakes up here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, he, de he decided that it was the opposite, that the earth went around the sun and, and all the 12 planets in our solar system. I see some fun. I, I did that on purpose. There's not 12. Anyway, that doesn't matter. <laughs> but uh, but um, it made people mad. Why do you think it made people mad? When he suggested that the earth was not the center of the universe. Okay, it's, it's different than what they were taught. Why else? Blucking tradition, okay. Well, I gave you the key of what I was looking for. We want to be the center of the, of, of the universe. And when we find out that the earth, we're the most important people, when the earth is not the center of the universe, it made people upset. But it did finally gain acceptance that, the, that everything went around the sun. There's a problem with that, though, isn't there? What's the problem with that? Not everything goes around the sun. The sun also goes around. And I, and I wrote down, it takes an orbit of about 250 billion years for our solar system to rotate through. And ex it, it more and more and more, there's th I still believe there's some green men out there. But <laughs> I, picked, I pulled out... Um, how many of you get this little thing from um, John Clayton? And, and he talked a little bit about, about the, the uh, James Webb Space Telescope in his first deal. Has anybody ever heard of that? It only cost $10 billion to put up in space so they can see further into space. But uh, did you know that it takes eight minutes and 20 seconds for the light from the sun to get to the Earth? The, the sun could go dark. And for eight minutes, we wouldn't know it. That's kind of interesting. Anyway, uh, but a light year is, a light year is, what's bigger than a trillion? Five quadrillion? I don't know. Over almost six, whatever that is, quadrillion, uh, it takes for a light year. So if we look at, any, anyway, it, you should get this little pamphlet. It's and I ramble. So, so we, the point, the point of all of that, the thing that I'm talking about there is we like to have, we like to be the center of life. We have to have the something that is center for importance to us. And we look for that. When we were children, we looked to our parents as the center of our lives. But it wasn't long that we wanted more than that. Just the parents were, what, were everything we want. And we started asking the question, what do I base my life on? What is really important? How can I find meaning? And so that's where we are. That's what the teacher is saying. Now he stated his statement at the beginning for the first 11 verses. Now he's going to go back. What did I say he did all the time in Ecclesiastes? He did repeat, repeat explain, repeat. He continues to do that, and he'll do that in a little more detail at this point. Uh, thanks, Steve, for your article uh, in the bulletin. It is a little early. That's next week, chapter 3. Well, so 
Yeah, no, no, that's fine. <laughs> that, I, did, I did acknowledge that I read your, your article, though. <laughs> so, the teacher, trying to get myself back together, the teacher is telling us how he went about to find what was the center of his life. What is he, he knew he needed to find something that was important, the value of the center of his, to value his life on. And he hoped in doing something he would find meaning. Uh, and he realized that there was more than one thing that could be the center of his life. So uh, he talks about human wisdom, we've talked about. He talks about pleasure. He talks about achievement. Uh, he's, talked, he's talked that life is meaningless. And he does that and that's in a very depressing way. And then he, now he's going to tell us how, to a certain extent, how he went about that. And he did it. Why is he qualified to talk about that? Because it was, I'm not sure I heard you, but it is his life. It's exactly what he did on his experience. So what I want us to do is begin by reading, uh, we're going to start in chapter 12 and read, read down through uh, uh, verse 18, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 1, verse 12 through 18, and then we'll, we'll make some observations. I think it's kind of a synopsis statement in a way, and then he goes into a little bit more detail in chapter 2. Uh, someone read that out loud for me, loudly. I am the teacher who was king over Israel and Jerusalem. I devoted myself to study and explore by wisdom all that is done under the heaven. Now, what, what a heavy burden God has laid on me. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless and chasing after the wind. What is twisted cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be found. I thought to myself, look, I've grown and increased in wisdom more than anyone who ruled over Jerusalem before me. I've experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied myself to the understanding and also of the madness, uh, of madness and folly that I have learned that this too is a chasing after the wind. For much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. Okay, all right. Make some observations. How would you sum that up? What's his synopsis statement that he's making? I'm giving, now I'm going to give you time to speak. Okay, all right. That's for the short one. I've been there and done that. Okay, yeah. been there, done that. Yeah, I've experienced those, and he's going to come in, in the next chapter, we're going to come into some more of that detail of what, he talk, what he's talking about. Uh, did anything, uh, one of the, uh, go ahead, before I interject. I thought there were a couple of interesting things about how he went about it, about his experiments, if you will. Yes, go ahead. Say that again. Okay, uh, and that's one thing I observed too is the fact that he didn't just look from a wisdom side. He looked from the folly side as well, both sides, a, a kind of a balanced uh, viewpoint. And he found, found what? What did he find? It was still what? All was, what's our word? Meaningless, meaningless. Or uh, as he uh, said, it's striving after the wind, striving after the wind. And so he didn't see... Uh, uh, I, that was one of the things I said. Do you see the frustration? Look at verse 13. Do you see a little frustration? What's the expressing there? It's, what's he saying in verse 13? Heavy it's a heavy burden that God has put on us, right? And he's laid it on the men to come to this earth and to, to struggle through life uh, let me ask you, how many of you have ever been frustrated with this life? Of course. We're all frustrated. Uh, 
I hope I said that right. Not fl- uh, sometimes I say frustrated. But uh, yes, we all can be frustrated. Of course, the point is, we are going to be without God. Dwayne? Right. I actually think he does. If you if you look, and we'll and I'll show you a passage here in just a little bit where he does say God, uh, uh, Solomon does ask. He, he'll give him anything. He gives him wisdom because he gave him wisdom. He, he acquired all these other things as well. The point though is, what about Solomon? He was the wisest man on earth, and yet what? He still made mistakes. He still made, and and that's what he's talking about here. Dennis, you had a thought? Exactly. And I have a statement in my next lesson about list of wisdom, the things from human wisdom that are good, but then there's even folly in the wisdom at times. So we'll read, we'll get to that sometime. What other ways can we, what other things frustrate us and give us a burden, Alan? (laughs) Exactly. Yes, absolutely. I mean, we could, I could go around the room and ask each one of you. Somebody, each one of us has dealt with something that is very difficult to deal with in this life. Crystal? Exactly. Okay. All right. Uh, just just a, uh, a couple of thoughts, I think. Uh, we, we, in some ways, we live in a world uh, that, that has suffering that doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense. And it doesn't matter who you are or what you have. At times, it's indiscriminate. And you still have to deal with those things, cancer, accidents. Uh, And we live in a society today that has much more medical knowledge than it's ever been. And yet we still have tons of suffering. And so it can be frustrating. So keep that in mind as we think about this. There is the answer, of course, is there's meaning only if you have God in your life. So here's the things, let's look at the specific things he talks about that he tried to try out, to find meaning, to find the center of his life. Uh, Beginning in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Someone read just chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Okay, so he's trying out what first? I don't know if every version says it, but he says it twice in that, in Alan's version. He's trying pleasure, pleasure. Now, let me interject real quick and ask you, is there anything wrong with fun and laughter? Is there anything wrong with that? Well, then why is he saying that? It, 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 without God, it doesn't mean, it's meaningless, okay? That doesn't mean we can't find some pleasure in life. But I'll make that point later. Did I see another hand? Another thought? No, it's good to have laughter. It's good to have pleasure. 
if it's not the center of your life. If God isn't the center of your life, that is what he's saying, his meaning. It's what he said. That's what he says. That's what the teacher says. Okay? Verse 3. Verse 3. I explored with my mind how to stimulate my body with wine while my mind was guiding me wisely and how to take hold of of uh, folly until I could see what good there was is for the sons of men to do under heaven in few years of their in the few years of their life. So what's he talking about here? What's he trying to? Uh, what's he try next? Uh, 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 yes, exactly. He, uh, uh, drink, drink. He finds. Uh, I, I read one of the commentaries says. He became a party animal, a party animal. And literally he did. If you go back and read what he did, what kind of parties he threw, it was unbelievable. Now, I tried to think about, I, look, I even looked up on the internet, can you think of somebody in our society that's famous that's a party animal? Come on. Who? Uh, Don Henley? Okay, so I don't know who Don Henley is. So <laughs> He's what? Oh, uh, from the Eagles. Yeah, okay, all right. Who, el who else? Charlie Sheen. Okay, Hugh Hefner. Okay, good. I, I actually looked it up. I said, put in on my line, I said, party animal, and Paris Hilton popped up. <laughs> so... Whoever they thought was a party animal that was a, a famous person. So uh, he was a party animal. He wanted to find meaning through being in a party. And uh, I, I know this is, uh, uh, turn back to Proverbs, just a couple of pages. Proverbs, the 23rd chapter. And I'll get on a, a little side trip here when we're talking about drink. And look at verse 29. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contention? Chapter 23, did I say that? Verse 29. Who has wounds without cod? Who has redness of eyes? Those who linger long over wine, those who go, who go to taste mixed wine, do not look at the wine when it is red, for it sparkles in the cup when it goes down smoothly. At last it bites like a serpent. It steams like a vapor. A viper, your eyes will see strange things, and your mind will utter perverse things, etc. On and on and on, it talks about. Now, I just go to that passage for one reason. Um, I'm not trying to make a statement on whether you drink or not drink. That's something that is totally uh, in your court. I'm just saying, I believe the scriptures are pretty adamant about abstinence. That's my opinion, okay? I'm not forcing that on anybody. And the reason is passages just like that that say it's easy to abuse and find yourself in abusing it. I've always said I could always abuse it, but it's going to be harder for me because I don't have any. I, haven't, I don't go buy it. Uh, it's not available. So when I get into to a difficult situation, it's not there. And so uh, that's my side pedestal, if you will. Just, just a thought process. All right? Uh, that passage could be written today and applied, and uh, many others as well. So he tried uh, pleasure. He tried being the party animal. Now he goes to achievement. Uh, someone read the 4th through the 10th verse of chapter 2. 4 through 10.
Okay? You think he accomplished anything? Just go back and do a little bit of reading, and you're going to find the tremendous, of course, we know he also built the temple uh, during his time. I don't know. That, that was uh, um, not mentioned there, but uh, he denied himself. And, and I, let me stress, let me stress that this was not a figment of his imagination. He had it all. He had wisdom. He had wealth. He had accomplishments. And he put it to the test. It's not an exaggeration. I'll turn back to 1 Kings. I'm, I'm not going to read all these passages. We will uh, just... 1 Kings, the fourth chapter. 1 Kings, the fourth chapter. His wisdom. I talk, told you I was going to just talk about that briefly. If you, go, if you start in verse 29 and go through 24, you can see, you can scan that yourself. You can see some of the wisdom that he had and the amount of, of, uh, of knowledge he had and proverbs and songs that he had written and uh, the things that he did with his wisdom. Then turn over to uh, chapter 10. Turn over to chapter 10, verse 14. Now the weight of gold which came to Solomon in one year was 666 talents of gold. Uh, hang on to that. I did a little research. And go over to chapter 11, verse 3. And this is one we know well. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. And his wives turned his heart away. Okay. So, here's some of the research, a little bit of research I did. And if you want to look at his achievements, look at 1 Kings 6 and 7 and 2 Chronicles, the ninth chapter. I looked up that the, the amount was, in some, ver does, does the uh, uh, New America, I mean, the NIV say 25 tons of gold, uh, verse 14 of chapter 10? Okay, tons. Uh, uh, I looked up. I looked this up, and uh, that tw roughly twenty-five tons of gold is w equivalent at two hundred two thousand dollars an ounce of sixty-four point three million dollars in today's wealth in one year. And he reigned for forty years. Forty years, which would be would have accumulated somewhere in the neighborhood of sixty-four billion three hundred thousand eight hundred thousand. I mean, three hundred million eight hundred thousand dollars. He had everything. One commentary said he had twenty-five tons of gold each year in today's measure and sixty ton of women. No offense, ladies. I don't know what that measurement was. I didn't divide that out to find out how many, but that was a little hum that was supposed to be humorous. So I may get in, I may be in trouble. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no doubt he knew. He he had everything. Go back to uh, Ecclesiastics. If I teach this again, I think I won't mention that. <laughs> I'm just doing what he said. Ecclesiastes, the second chapter, then again back to verse 11. Thus I considered all my activities which my hands had done and the labor which I had exerted, and behold, all was vanity, meaningless, and striving after the wind, and there was no profit under the sun. Where do we find, try to find accomplishments in this world today? How do we go about trying to find accomplishments? Okay.
okay, from the positive side that you're talking about, that we find, we find accomplishment. We find ourselves like what Solomon is doing as well at times, where we get turned inwardly thinking only of ourselves, and that's part of the point. But where you should be finding accomplishment is in serving others. Bill? Okay. Okay. And I think that's part of what we're talking about, Bill, that, that our heart can deceive us. And that's kind of what he's saying. That's what, he's, what Solomon's saying here. What the teacher is saying is we can look for those things. Go ahead and look for those things. And we do. We look for, we look at, for achievements. We look for education. We look for wealth. We look for... Uh, those kind of things, position, those are the kind of things we find ourselves involved in. Not necessarily wrong, right? Am I right? They're not necessarily wrong to do those things. What's the key? We'll, we'll say it a thousand times in this class. What's the key? Where is your heart really? And you made the point, I think David's making the point that he set, Solomon set his heart on these things because he thought that would bring him fulfillment. But he's telling it. He's looking inward, okay? All right? Now he's finally, it appears, he's, as we look through the end of the chapter, the, the book, it appears that he finally comes to the conclusion I need to turn. A different direction. I need to turn to something else. Dwayne? I hope it's okay to get education because I, uh, you know, I have some education. But what we, I think part of the point is, and part of the point he's making is, it can give you false uh, security, or it can give you counterfeit meaning. It has a counterfeit meaning to it. That's what Solomon's saying. It's counterfeit at times because it's time for you to stop and take stock in what and who you really are. Michaela? Yeah, and I think that's right, and don't, don't run me out, but this is something I, I, it always bugs me. In our society, when we have something at church that, uh, I hope I'm not going to offend anybody, we have something at church that's about taking care of your finances, we have a church full. If we want to talk about our spiritual finances and wealth, we have to beg people to come. Why is that? That's what you're talking about, Michaela. It's because we've conditioned ourselves to that's the way God wants us to be successful. And I'm guilty. I'm, I told Wayne earlier, I retired from, from four jobs down to three jobs now that I'm retired. It, it, you know, so, so I'm, I'm talking to myself, Wayne. Thought? Thank you. 
Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. There is, even those who don't believe in God find some pleasure. And I'll say it, I, if I make it to that point in my class, what's the difference? When they get to the end of life, what? They forfeit it all. That's what we're talking about. Let's read 12 through 16. 12 through 16 quickly. I got a full page left. And the real point's coming yet. Someone read it for me. Okay, kind of a, I'm going to hurry a little bit through this section, but kind of a contrast between the wise man and the foolish, and, and uh, better for the wise man than the foolish, but ultimately what? Ultimately, the same conclusion, the same conclusion. And then he says, and the message is clear, and he says, so I hated life for the work which was done under the sun, which grievous, was grievous to me, because everything is futility and striving after the wind. Now, let's read, uh, let's begin then in verse uh, 18. I think there's a little, a little twist of uh, humor in this right here, in this next section. So see if you can see. Thus I hated all the fruit of my labor for which I had labored under the sun, for I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise, a wise man or a fool. Yet he will he have control over all the fruit of my labor, which I have labored by acting wisely under the sun. This too is vanity. I'm going to stop right there. You see the humor in that? Maybe it's just me. What's he saying there? He says, I'm going to work hard all my life, and then what am I going to do? Leave it to somebody else, and who knows if they're a fool or a wise man. And what happens to, to Solomon? Solomon's son, who? Uh, Steve, do you know? Rehoboam. He sought the advice of the wise old men and the, and the young men. He took the advice of the wise, young men, and the next thing you know, the kingdom is in complete shatters. He was a fool. So the point, of the, the message of that is don't leave money to your kids, spend it. <laughs> it's, oh, that's not, that's not the moral of the story? Okay, anyway, I, I find that uh, there's, a little, there's a little irony in that. Uh, but he's, he's making a point. Therefore I completely despaired of all the fruit of my labor which I had labored under the sun. When the man who has labored his, with wisdom, knowledge, and skill and gives his legacy to one who has not labored with them, this too is vanity and a great evil. For what does a man get in all of his labor and all of his striving which which he labors under the sun? Because all of his days his task is painful and grievous. Even at night his mind does not rest. This too is vanity. And of course he's... he's, a, he's Saying that again, and we've made, the, we've made that point as well. So in verse 24, he kind of departs from where he's been in the woe, woe, woe state, 
And he makes a solid statement in saying, there is nothing better for a man than to eat and drink and tell himself that his labor is good. This also I've seen, that it is from the hand of God. For what? Who can eat and who can have enjoyment without him? Kind of sums it up. He kind of sums up what he's saying. Uh, a life that's centered on things of this world leads to spiritual bankruptcy. God is the source of the true things. Now quickly turn over to Matthew. We'll pick up where the sixth chapter where Wayne was talking about. And we'll look at another teacher, some who was called teacher. And that is Jesus. Very familiar passage. Uh, don't be anxious what you should eat and drink, what, what shall be clothe yourself, but seek first, skipping down, his kingdom and his righteousness, and these things shall be added to you. I was going to leave us some time to talk about that, and we don't have time to really explore, uh, explore the things that Jesus, God, can supply our, and our needs. Uh, I wish we did. I I've, uh, apologize for that. But um, instead of centering yourself on things, which David was talking about, of this world, center your life on the creator of this world. God will then supply the things that you wanted all along. Now, I'm, I'm going to leave that for a moment. That's where I was going to do some discussion. But do you see what's going on? Do you see what the teacher is saying? Take a look at your life. Take a look at your life. Take a spiritual inventory. If you're frustrated with the way things are going, it's probably because things are more important than God. If you're frustrated with the way things are going, it's probably because things are more important than God. But don't feel bad. Everyone has that. Everyone has those moments. Everyone has those days. Even Christians. Even Christians. It boils down to, if we go back in that same chapter of Matthew, the sixth chapter, laying up treasures in the verse 19th verse, and I wish we could have some time to really explore this, Lay up treasures in heaven, not on earth. Lay them up in heaven, not on earth. And I, there's a multitude of ways to do that. Uh, uh, I'll just say, if that's, it, I, I hope I can figure out a way to do that because I think it's so important. Christians can, t but here's my last point. I'll end on this. I'll end on this thought. To be complete, perfect fulfillment of life. The true revelation of meaningfulness awaits us in heaven. Until that time, Christians can taste a bit of true life and meaningfulness here on the earth. Even non-believers can too, in a limited sense but they're going to lose it all in the end. Just like we talked about. Complete understanding will only come then. So you will end up being frustrated. You will have those days. There will be times when we won't be focusing like we should, but try to bring yourself back to that. That's the most important. Let's end with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful uh, we're, we're thankful that you're continually reminding us what is really important. And if we study your word, Father, we pray and hope that we can keep ourselves on track and not allow things and false security and things of this world to decide practice from your ultimate uh, love for us and provisions for us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.